Hello and thank you for being here. My name is Jacob Goodman, and today I'm going to take you through the story of my ancestors that I've discovered over the last seven years. First, let me introduce you to some of them. Ancestors, meet the people of Carmel. Carmel, meet my ancestors. I'm a direct descendant of each of the people pictured here. Most of them lived and died in Indiana, and so my roots here go very far back. But growing up, I can't say those roots always made me feel totally at home. Maybe because of the red hair or because I was a nerd who didn't play sports, I felt a little bit like an outsider. I'm sure some of you have felt that way before. Most of us grow up with only a vague understanding of our family history. Even if you're lucky enough to have grandparents who pass down information to you, that information is often limited to a few family lines and might go back a few hundred years at best. Traditional genealogy is the study of family history using legal documents like marriage certificates and census records, along with written and oral family tradition. Genetic testing, like that offered at 23andMe and Ancestry.com, allows us to get estimates of our ethnic heritage and compare our DNA to other people who've been tested. Genetic genealogy leverages the power of these two sciences so that we can uncover stories about ourselves and the human history that we all share. So if you will, please allow me to take you through some of the things I've learned. To continue, I'd like to say a few things. On this journey, I've learned that family life is really complicated. There is no such thing as normal. And if you want to study your ancestry, be prepared for a few surprises. I learned that some influences can be just as powerful as the DNA we inherit. The love of an adoptive parent or grandparent the companionship of our friends and spouses, and the perspectives of our favorite teachers, books, movies, and songs. I've learned that as a white American man, I have some unfair advantages when researching my ancestry. Most women were not listed by name in the US Census until 1850. Most black Americans were not listed by name until 1870. Many American Indians were not listed at all until 1900. But I've learned that regardless of your background, there's never been a better time to study family history. The digitization of historic records and the affordability of genetic testing give us access to tools and knowledge our ancestors could not have imagined. All right, let's dig in. What else did I learn? I learned I'm about as European as I look. No big surprises there. You can see the full list above, but most of my DNA comes from England, Ireland, Scotland, and Germany. I've had my DNA tested at Ancestry.com, 23andMe, and Family Tree DNA, and they all say about the same thing. These tests tell you where a subset of your ancestors came from about a thousand years ago. Notice I said a subset of your ancestors. Why is that? Well, when I started studying my family tree, the first thing I learned was that we all have a lot of ancestors. And because of the way DNA is inherited, you only carry the DNA of a subset of those ancestors. We all know every person has two biological parents. We rarely stop to appreciate how those numbers add up when we look back four or more generations. Each of us has 16 great-great-grandparents. They are your grandparents' grandparents, so not that far back in the grand scheme of things. Go back two more generations and you have 64 fourth great-grandparents. Not even 200 years ago, your fourth great-grandparents, all 64 of them, were roaming the earth, making friends, forming families. And each of their decisions and experiences eventually brought you into being and helped you be here today to attend this event. On average, about 1.5% of your DNA comes from each of those 64 ancestors. I say on average because while you get a pretty even 50-50 contribution of DNA from your biological parents, the percentages beyond that are prone to some randomness. That means you might get 1% of your DNA from one fourth great grandparent and 2% from another. Go back a total of 10 generations and you have up to 1,024 eighth great-grandparents. You get an average of 0.1% of your DNA from each of these ancestors at that level. 
Because of random inheritance, you might not carry any DNA of some of your eighth great grandparents. While these ancestors' experiences and decisions still impacted the path of your family through time, their genetic impact in your family tree was lost by the time you were conceived. I learned that even though we don't carry the DNA of some of our ancestors, the DNA we do carry is ancient and tells an almost unimaginable story. Sites like GEDmatch and My True Ancestry will compare your DNA to DNA extracted from ancient human remains some thousands of years old. Matches here aren't necessarily your direct ancestors, but you would share a common ancestor with them. My closest relative among these ancient samples is that of an Anglo-Saxon who immigrated to England in the year 400 AD. I also shared DNA with ancient samples from 2,000 years ago in Ireland, 4,000 years ago in Spain, and 8,000 years ago in Germany. It is incredible to think I might not share DNA with one of my eighth great grandparents, but I do share DNA with a Neolithic farmer in Germany from 8,000 years ago. Even more incredible to me, I've learned that most of us carry DNA that comes from early human populations that no longer exist. I share a chunk of DNA on my 14th chromosome with a Neanderthal who lived 49,000 years ago in Spain. In fact, 23andMe says I have more Neanderthal genes than approximately 82% of their customers, accounting for a little less than 2% of my DNA. Scientists now know that human migration out of Africa actually began around 1 to 2 million years ago. These early waves of human became distinct populations with measurable genetic differences. The most studied among them are the Neanderthals, but scientists also confirm another group called the Denisovans. Waves of human migration continue to occur periodically. Around 70,000 years ago, a very large wave of people began immigrating out of Africa, and they would become the primary contributors of DNA to all Eurasians, Australians, and people from the Americas today. As this wave of early humans spread out, they, inherit, they interacted with the Neanderthals and Denisovans who were already there. We may never know how these interactions played out, but what we do know is that these populations had children together. Distinct communities of Neanderthals and Denisovans disappeared around 40,000 years ago, but the humans of mixed genetic heritage continued to live and have children with these late wave humans. Since then, we know there have also been multiple waves of back migration into Africa from Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. These people brought their DNA back with them, and we now know that like Europeans and Asians, most Africans also carry trace DNA from Neanderthals and Denisovans. I've learned that the narrative of humanity is not linear. And no matter how distinct the differences between us seem, we share a history that stretches back millions of years. We all come from civilizations that rose and fell. Communities that immigrated and came back. Families that fell apart and somehow got back together. We are the culmination of so many experiences, and we have the privilege of continuing the next chapter of the human experience. Of course, I learned a lot about my family's more recent history too. Almost all branches of my family tree lead to ancestors who arrived in America before the Revolutionary War. Most were poor, some were middle class. Some of my family even arrived in Indiana before it became a state in 1816. For example, my fourth great grandparents, James and Jane Langford, lived in a cave on the Ohio River in 1808 when they first arrived. There's a plaque there memorializing their story. These pictures are from when I visited a few years ago. My fourth great-grandparents, Elijah and Nancy Staggs, were some of the first settlers to arrive near Terre Haute, Indiana. They raised 10 kids together until Nancy's death from cholera in 1849. This is a picture of me right after my family and I found their graves in the middle of the woods, almost completely buried. Because I come from large families of early settlers, I share DNA with a lot of people around here. On Ancestry.com alone, I share DNA with 60,000 people. 
When I ordered a DNA test for my best friend Amanda, turns out we're approximately fifth cousins. We share a chunk of DNA on our first chromosomes. Using genetic genealogy, I was able to determine that Amanda is related to me through my mom's dad, Jerry, and his mom, Lulu. My best friend growing up, Joe, was also my neighbor. And we're actually second cousins. Our grandmothers were half-sisters who never knew each other. My grandma is Dorothy on the left. His grandma is Madonna on the right. Their father was a colorful character who did not maintain contact with his first family after he started his second. My dad and Joe's mom had no idea they were first cousins and they were neighbors for 10 years. My third great grandfather, Christopher Wessler, was the son of German immigrants who settled near Evansville, Indiana around 1840. Over the course of Christopher's life, he worked as a lawyer, teacher, and elected official. He fought for the Union in the Civil War. He also traveled back and forth between Evansville and Colorado many times in the 1870s and 80s to survey land and manage gold mines. He published articles supporting progressive ideas like women's rights and democratic socialism. His wife, Julia, was also the child of German immigrants, and the two were married until Christopher's death in 1918. My great-great-grandmother, Tura Dawson, was born in Kentucky in 1879. By the time she was a teenager, her mother had passed away, and she lived with her father and three younger brothers on the banks of the Ohio River in Henderson, Kentucky. Her father, George Hickman Dawson, went by the name Hick and worked as a fisherman. The family lived in a shanty home in a neighborhood known as Fishtown. In 1895, at the age of 16, Tura married another fisherman named Thomas Goodman, my great-great-grandfather. Thomas and Tura were married 10 years, during which time many dramas played out. This was an era of riverboat gambling and moonshining, and Thomas struggled to avoid conflict with his peers and with law enforcement. Eventually, on Valentine's Day in 1906, <clears throat> at the age of 33, Thomas died after being shot by a young man he employed on his fishing boats. The two were known to fight often. Tura and Thomas had one child, my great-grandfather, Joseph Goodman, who was only four years old at the time of his father's death. Tura married three more times, eventually settling down with her fourth husband, Ed Young, who she was married to 38 years until her death in 1964. My dad actually remembers meeting Tura multiple times as a kid, but unfortunately, we don't have any pictures of her. However, I'm very lucky to have inherited many old photos, some directly from my close family and some from distant cousins I've met doing genealogy. Let me show you a few more of my favorites. I could probably go on for hours. But let me finish up by saying that studying my family history has helped bring me closer to a sense of belonging. It's given me perspective and appreciation for everything that had to occur for me to be here. These last seven years, I've been able to share these stories with my parents, siblings, and extended family. We forged new connections with each other and with our ancestors. We all inherit strengths and challenges, stories of success and failure, and just about everything in between. Whatever we feel, they've felt it too. <laughs> I hope after this, you will be curious to learn more about your history and the history of others. Thank you for listening.